Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthy Hong Kong. Welcome to the interview series with Dr. Vittorio Sebastiano from Stanford University. In video one, Dr. Sebastiano explained the concept behind ERA, epigenetic reprogramming of aging, a technology that aims to reprogram aged human cells to a more youthful state without losing their identity. In this video, Dr. Sebastiano will differentiate between the process of producing IPSC induced pluripotent stem cells and ERA. He also talks about ERA working with senescent cells and telomeres. For any viewers new to this field, let me provide a little background on some of the terms that came up in this discussion. First, induced pluripotent stem cells, also known as IPSCs. A pluripotent stem cell is a cell that has the ability to become any kind of cell in the body. They are naturally found in embryos. An induced pluripotent stem cell is one that has been generated directly from a somatic cell, where a somatic cell is any of the normal cells in our body apart from the sperm or the egg. The IPSC technology was pioneered by Shinya Yamanaka's lab in Kyoto, Japan, where they showed in 2006 that the introduction of four specific genes named OC34, SOX2, KLF4 and CMYK encoding transcription factors could convert somatic cells into pluripotent stem cells. Dr. Yamanaka was awarded the 2012 Nobel Prize for his work. Next, senescent cells. These are cells in the body which have stopped dividing and performing their main function but also have not been destroyed through apoptosis. As we grow older we tend to accumulate more senescent cells which among other things release inflammatory markers into the body. And finally telomeres. These are the caps which protect the end of the chromosomes. As cells divide, the telomeres become shorter, creating a limit to the number of times a division can happen. Longer telomeres are generally considered a sign of youthfulness. And with that, let me start the interview. So could you talk a little bit about pluripotent stem cells, right, which, which go the whole way back? Um, to this pluripotent stem cell, basically. So yeah. uh, can you talk about you know, how ERA differs from that? Because you're not going that far, right? Yeah, yeah so that, that's a great point. Uh, uh, so the cloning experiments are impractical from a, from a, from a, you know, from a, uh, from a clinical standpoint, of course. So yeah. the breakthrough discovery of Shinya Yamanaka the IPS uh, has shown that actually a, a very similar process to the cloning can be done in vitro in a test tube in any lab in the world. And you can actually pretty much do the same uh, reversion of uh, identity uh, and age to an embryonic like state just by adding just a handful of, of transcription factors. Uh, and that, of, of course, you know, it's been a, a breakthrough discovery because now you, know, you can use those cells to generate any cell in the body. Uh, but that was the key, actually, to our experiments, because we said, okay, uh, since we can do the same process of rejuvenation and cell identity change in the lab, right, by, by going all the way back to IPS, what if we just uh, do that process, that reprogramming that typically takes anyway between three to four to five weeks, but what if we can just... Uh, um, um, you know, uh, understand that whole process from, let's say, a somatic cell to an IPS. We know that, you know, that takes three weeks, let's say. What if we just reprogram for a very short period of time? What if we control in time the reprogramming? Uh, can we measure any rejuvenation uh, without seeing any change in cell identity? Because we have been doing this work for, for many years now, you know, almost more than 15 years now. So we really know every single step of that process that you know, leads to uh, a somatic cell or um, yeah, a skin cell, let's say, to an IPS. And we know that actually the change in cell identity, so the switch, what we call the point of no return, the switch from uh, that skin cell to an embryonic-like cell occurs uh, uh, you know, after, when you are almost half the way through, uh, half the way through, sorry, or, or two thirds of the way through in this process. Uh, we also knew uh, that if we interrupt the reprogramming early enough, uh, the cells don't change their identity. So in other words, 
we take a skin cell, if we reprogram for just, let's say, a short period of time, we know that the reprogramming to the IPS fails. We cannot make IPSCs. We, can, we still end up with the same cell type we started with. Uh, but that was a, a great thing for us because we said, okay, that's great because that means that the reprogramming, so the cell identity hasn't been lost as of yet. Uh, but can we see any, any signs of rejuvenation in that short window of time? And that's exactly what we did. So we really used uh, a, a tightly controlled uh, um, a platform to express these reprogramming factors that are usually used for, to make IPSCs. Uh, and we just expressed them for a very, very short period of time. We started with two, three, four, five, six days. And we saw that actually there was, you know, the threshold or, or, or the limit was, it, it changes with different cell types. Of course, it's not always the same for every, for every cell type. But we saw that in the case of skin cells, for example, there was about four to five days. So we couldn't do any longer because otherwise we would have lost the skin cells. And so we stopped there and we said, okay, uh, we know that we can reprogram the cells for, 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 such a, you know, for, for such a period of time. And in such a window, we don't lose their identity. So do we see any signs of rejuvenation? Uh, and since we're, we're thinking, we thought that this is an epigenetic program and uh, you know, the epigenetic program is really at the core of how a cells function, we said, okay, let's look at all the hallmarks of aging because uh, the epigenetic program is really dictating what the cells does, uh, how it behaves, what genes it expresses, you know, the physiology of the cells, everything. So it's hierarchically is a very important, you know, hallmark. So we said, okay, uh, we believe that there is an epigenetic rejuvenation going on, or at least that was the, the, the hypothesis. So we said, okay, this must have an effect on a variety of different hallmarks of aging. So we looked at all of them. Uh, we looked at telomere attrition, we looked at uh, nutrient sensing, other epigenetic marks, uh, we looked at uh, mitochondrial functionality, uh, oxidative stress, all of them. And we saw that across, so there's nine of them, and we looked at all of them, and we saw that basically all of them were actually going in the right direction, meaning in a more juvenile, more youthful uh, direction, with the exception of one, which is the telomere. So the telomeres were not elongated by our, by our technology. Uh, but that's, that's actually a good thing uh, for two reasons. First of all, because telomere attrition or telomere shortening um, is primarily affecting a specific type of aging cells, which are called the senescent cells. So it's not the general characteristics of, of aging cells. It's, it's, it's affecting a, a subtype of aging cells, which are the so-called senescent cells. The second reason is that since we, we, we wanted, or we claimed at least, that uh, we are not changing the identity of the cells, the telomere elongation or the gene responsible for the elongation of the telomeres is only active in stem cells. And so if you take a skin cell, that's not a stem cell. So it's not supposed to express that gene. And so by not seeing an, el an elongation of telomeres, we were also further confirming that we were not changing the identity of, of that cells because it was not expressing a, a gene which is not supposed to be expressed by that cell type. <clears throat> Right, so I had, I had a kind of question on that. Uh, yeah. So the, the telomere length, I, I believe, controls like how many times the cell can divide. Um, or, or it is related to, I don't know if it's controlling the right. Yeah, more or less, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Hayflick limit. Um, so if you create this young cell by reprogramming the epigenetics, but you haven't changed the telomere length, uh, is there some kind of conflict there between um, you know, like, like the cell can't, the cell is still young, but stock can't divide anymore. Uh, yeah, that, that, is a, that is a great question. So, um, well, as I said, the telomere attrition doesn't seem to be such a big deal, at least for human cells. Uh, and that's, that's still not so clear, you know, why this is so. So, for example, uh, there, there is a lot of differences, for example, when you look at mouse and human cells. In mice, there is a very, very rapid, you know, shortening of the telomeres. Uh, and, you know, the shortening of the telomeres has been seen in a variety of different tissues and cells in the body. In human cells, it seems to be, well, first of all, more slow. Uh, second of all, uh, there, doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be such, a, such an important effect of telomere attrition in the vast majority of the cells. 
there is a, the cells that, you're absolutely right, the cells that actually undergo a lot of cell divisions and, you know, have much, much, much shorter uh, telomeres are the ones that at some point enter senescence. That means that and they, they become all of a sudden, um, they don't cycle anymore. They become, they stop. They stop, you know, their growth. Um, and, you know, that's because basically during this journey or these, during these cell cycles, not only they have shortened the telomeres, but probably they have also accumulated a number of other, you know, mutations uh, and chromosomal aberrations. So the cells basically stop because uh, if they keep growing, potentially they could become cancerous cells. Mm -hmm. So that is a mechanism, a, a safety mechanism that some cells, the senescent cells have to basically prevent uh, carcinogenesis from, from happening. Um, and, uh, uh, but as I said, you know, the senescent cells are the ones that, you know, are primarily affected by this shortening of the telomeres. The vast majority of the other cells are not. And, and, and why is that? Because probably um, it is not true in vivo or in our body, it is not true that, you know, the cells are really cycling 50, 60, 17 times over the, over the course of the, of the year. What is probably, you know, what is probably happening is that, you know, they're constantly replaced by new cells that are coming from stem cells or from progenitor cells, which are, you know, in that specific tissue. And so uh, the, the, the average number that a cell goes through, uh, the average number of cell cycles that a cell goes through is not as high as, you know, the Hayflick limit. So I don't know if it makes sense. What I'm... Right. So... Can I, I watched one of your, your talks and you, you talked about senescent cells and that the, the, they're not that many percentage wise. Um, so does your, does the epigenetic reprogramming also affect senescent cells or, or would you like also need to take some form of senolytic to clear up the senescent cells? Yeah. Uh, so our data suggests that, you know, the senescent cells are not um, engaged in this program. And I have to say that, you know, thank God, because as I said, the senescent cells are bad cells. Uh, and if you kind of re-engage them into the, the game, they could potentially, uh, since they have accumulated so many mistakes, errors, chromosomal aberrations, potentially, they could actually be very, very, very bad actors that, you know, could develop into cancer. Um, so, no, uh, senescent cells, are not and should not be reprogrammed or rejuvenated, you know, in any way, because that actually could be could be uh, very bad for for the body. Um, senescent cells, though, like almost anything in nature, uh, have a dual function. So uh, are kind of the yin and yang uh, of, of of our body or our evolution. Uh, they were actually developed over the course of evolution for a very good purpose because uh, it. There are probably, and there is a lot of literature in the in the in the field that suggests that senescent cells are actually very important when it comes to wound healing, because they secrete a number of uh, uh, pro-inflammatory factors that recruit cells and you know kind of engage the residing cells to proliferate and you know restore a normal functionality in the in the tissue that has been wounded. The price that we have to pay, though, for having developed those cells. Uh, which are locally induced, uh, for example, by damage, uh, by fibrosis and, you know, um, injury and other things, the, the, the price that we have to pay for having developed that mechanism, you know, that promotes wound healing is that they also accumulate over the course of time. And at some point, you know, when we are aged, we have about one to 5% of the cells in the body, which are senescent. And those, instead of being good, uh, because, you know, they're, instead of promoting regeneration, actually they are, promote, they are, they are pumping in the blood system so much pro-inflammatory cytokines that these actually triggers an, an even further or even accelerated, accelerated process of, of aging. Mm. Uh, why am I saying that? Because that is, that is actually a very key aspect of what we are doing. Uh, the the pro-inflammatory cytokines that the senescent cells secrete in the context of the wound healing are also cytokines which are involved or somehow very similar to the, the, the cytokines which are which promote reprogramming. Uh, and so if we do this reprogramming in vivo, in the presence of senescent cells, it's possible. I don't have the proof of that, you know, but it's possible that actually the senescent cells may push the reprogramming, you know, even beyond the safe uh, point of no return. So 
the way we are envisioning, you know, the, the, the technology is that, you know, probably it's better, you know, to come in and first wipe out the senescent cells so that, you know, you kind of remove these, uh, you know, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which could, you know, extend the reprogramming process, you know, beyond the point of no return. And then, you know, reprogram the locally the cells in a very controlled way, because that's the key of the technology. Reprogramming the cells and rejuvenate the cells, you know, for a very short period of time to trigger, you know, uh, um, what we call uh, a cell intrinsic, a cell autonomous, you know, rejuvenation of the cells, which could potentially have also systemic uh, effects. Mm. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, so I just have this kind of vision of the, it, the way that the epigenetic reprogramming works. It, it's almost like a, a movie playing backwards, like you, you slowly accumulate all this damage and then when you put these uh, reprogramming factors in, it, it like replays that movie in a linear way, but at high speed. Would that be correct, or do you think it's happening in parallel? So there'll be some of the identity being changed before all of the aging has been removed, or will it really be linear? Um, th th that is what basically we are trying to, to understand. So we know our data so far suggests that you know there is there is a rejuvenation process uh, occurring at multiple levels. Um, so the cells are younger by all means, uh, even by, you know, by, by, by using new assays that are now being developed, uh, you know, in the field of aging. For example, the epigenetic clock that was developed by Steve Orbeth uh, and others. Uh, so we are really seeing that, you know, at all levels, using any hallmark of aging, we see a rejuvenation process uh, that is not... Uh, accompanied by any change in cell identity. So the technology seems to be very safe as long as you know exactly, you know, what is the window of, uh, of reprogramming, uh, which obviously makes this, you know, makes this technology right now amenable for in vitro applications, uh, you know, but not yet, uh, you know, amenable for in vivo applications where, you know, there's still, a, there is still a number of things or variables that are, cannot be controlled, but that's exactly what, uh, you know, we're working on. Um, so, you know, as I said, our data suggests that there is, you know, the, the technology seems to be safe and there seems to be a linear, a linear correlation between, you know, the time you reprogram the cells and the amount of, of aging that you can, uh, you, that you can, you can get. Thank you all for watching. Hope that you found the video informative. It's vital to keep the balance between reversing the epigenetic age markers of the cell and the loss of the cell identity. In the end, we don't want a skin cell to suddenly start thinking that it's a liver cell. We just want it to be a younger skin cell. In video three, Dr. Sebastiano will talk in more detail about the mechanisms behind the technology. So please stay tuned. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and I will speak to you again soon.